my destiny. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the initial podcast for the Black Book Podcast. Uh, Today, we have an amazing, stunning, intelligent guest, Olivia Nadine, with us today. Uh, I don't want to keep talking about it, so we're going to get right into this. All right. (laughs) All right, uh, Olivia, I mean, let's just start out by just... uh, just introduce yourself. Maybe you can tell people uh, where you're from or where you grew up and where you are now. All right. So I'm Olivia Nadine. I'm from Washington, D.C., born and raised D.C. proper, not Maryland, not Virginia. <laughs> um, and grew up in D.C., did my undergrad at Ohio State, where I did international business and a minor in Chinese. And that was where I first got to come to China, was at study abroad my junior year. Um, and then I did my master's, I did Teach for America, and then I did my master's at Georgetown, um, and did master's of Asian studies. So kept in keeping with the Asia, keeping with the China part. And as soon as I graduated, I got a job out here in Beijing and said yes, um, because part of my reason for getting my master's was to come back out here but in a position other than teaching. So um, yeah, I came out in 2016. I've been here ever since. I have been riding out really? this entire corona thing. You know what? Yeah. I feel like I, I came out here in 2016. I've always felt like you've been out here much longer than me. <laughs> you know, Everyone assumes I've been in China for like 10, 15 years. I'm like, I was not born here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get into that. That's, the re- I think the things that you do is the reason why I feel that way because <laughs> you know you don't you don't. You're not the first people. person who's told me, but yeah. studying Chinese in undergrad has helped. I think with being able to leverage being here because I've been studying the language for about too long, uh, about eleven years. Oh wow! To not okay. be fluent and to study a language for eleven years is kind of sad. That's why well, I hesitate to say it. But Chinese Chinese is not one of those languages where you can pick up in a day. Cause I also studied Chinese when I was in college, and uh, but for me, I didn't I didn't go abroad immediately. I didn't use Chinese for four years. Um, oh man, yeah. And, like like when I got to China, I couldn't remember anything. But like and maybe like after a couple of weeks, I started remembering. But I also mm-hmm. realized I needed to brush up, so I got me a teacher, and I've had I had I've had a teacher maybe since eight months of me being here. Okay. Yeah. I've been bad at getting a teacher. That part I've definitely neglected. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but like, yeah, I, I think a teacher. <laughs> I am not that good yet. I am not that. I hope to be able to do it one day. Uh, but nah, nah, that ain't me. There's still some technical terms I don't know yet, you know. Fair enough. After we did the knee house, I don't know how far I get either. <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh let's just keep going all right so i think well i had a, i had a i have a list of questions for you but you already answered one of them which is like what led you uh to go abroad which was you studied this you you know you were ready to come here you got a job right out of college blah 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 which is great i mean a lot of people don't do that i mean like i didn't come here right out of college i was like a year and a half out of college before mm-hmm. i came to china and things like that. What so you said you went to you went abroad while you were in school? For mm-hmm. like the first time? Yeah. Was this was that your first time going abroad? Um no. So I've always like since I was in seventh or eighth grade, I told my parents, I'm gonna live abroad. <laughs> like <laughs> right. when I'm in DC, you get to meet people from all over. My parents yeah. were real intentional about making sure we had exposure. Uh, Mm -hmm. even we never did we weren't we weren't rich so we never did like (laughs) summers in switzerland or something like that but i watched a lot of pbs i watched a lot of globe trekker i watched all the travel shows and so from a young age i was like i'm gonna live abroad um and so my first trip actually was um my it sounds i did just say we weren't rich but then this is going to sound rich but my parents from my graduation from high school got me a three-week trip 
around Europe. Oh, wow, that's um, cool. So it was with a program called People to People Exchange. Uh, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, People to People Exchange. Actually, it's a really cool program. It's for high school students to okay. have like an easier way to go abroad and have cultural interactions and do homestays and go see different monuments. So I did three weeks going through Italy, France, and the UK. And that was my oh. first time, got my first passport and everything. Um, and it was ever since then, that was 2008. Ever since then, I've just kept going. I did yeah. study abroad almost every year of undergrad. I didn't do, I didn't get the abroad bug until uh, I was actually like, I finessed like an immersion course, you know, um, while I was Jeez, in finessed into it when I was at school, you know, because like I was like minoring in history and uh, there was a, this really special course called Mayan Archaeoastronomy, um, where we studied basically Mayan culture and, um, and how they, uh, you know, came up with the calendar and their study in astronomy and stuff like that. And then this is during the second semester of my senior year, and then during spring break, we all went to uh, Mexico, southern Mexico. So, like, not Mexico City, not anything big. We went to, uh, I, the biggest place we went to was San Cristobal, San Cristobal, sorry, um, okay. which is in, you know, the deep south Mexico. Um, the Mexican geography is poor. <laughs> yeah. So it's right on the, it's right, every, like everywhere we went was right near the peninsula and like we went there to study that we went to the temple. So we went to see like maybe four or five different Mayan temples. It's like okay. the greatest, it's like the greatest experience I had, like ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was like, I gotta go. But like, I mean, like my parents, just like you, like we weren't like, you know, super snooty and rich. Like I'm from Chicago, I'm from Inglewood. So, you know, we, we real far from that, but my parents, um, we used to go on cruises every now and then. So I've had a passport since I was like maybe 13 years old. Um, and so we've gone to, yeah, we've had, we've gone to cruises to like Mexico mm. and like uh, Jamaica and the Cayman Islands and things like that. Um, but I mean, those, that's, that's vacation. I tell people nowadays, you ain't abroad if you ain't, if you go into the cruise. That's not really abroad. That's like, sub america and things like that <laughs> you know you tell that to caribbean people trying to come to the u.s <laughs> i mean but it's, it's it's different for them right because like when they come here they not you know they when they come to america they're going to have a real american experience um but i think a lot of people when they travel to mm. those places they yeah. they tend to stick to the Americans experience that has been built for them there. Um, and yeah. you know, a lot of, a lot of it is because of safety and you know, whatever. Um, but in my mind that ain't really like going abroad, you know, cause you could just hop it's back like on a plane. Yeah. <laughs> people gonna hate me that I said that. Like I already know people gonna hate me that I said that, but it's, I feel like it's a little true. Like, you know. Yeah, you know, what's a little, what's a, what's a podcast about a little bit of controversy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let's. Uh, I got another question for you. So, you your first job and your first job in China was teaching. No, it was not teaching. Job, no, my first job in China was so. Like I said, I did grad school because I wanted to come out here and not teach. So my first job was actually at a think tank. I was in. I was the operations coordinator. Or th on a U.S. China think tank out here, so I was doing wow. finance, HR, IT. Wow, I I didn't even know that about you. Wow, yeah, but, very to be honest. Know that. To be honest, very you know what? Like, you always assume being in China. You always assume if you are a foreign, ninety-five percent of the foreigners here teach in some capacity at mm -hmm. some like at a now like, I teach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whether it's like at an international yeah. school, if it's Montessori, if it's a language center, if it's a kindergarten, like most people you'll meet here, they're going to be teaching if they're a foreigner in China, you know, so that's pretty cool. I mean, I would love to hear more about that experience in the think tank. Um, that's not something that you, that, was, that is not a person you would meet every day in China. So, um, that's true. yeah. All right. It so, was an interesting yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would you do it again? 
Mm. I would have to say yes, because it got me to where I am now. Okay. So if how would you... If the, if the results wouldn't be the same, then nah. But um, <laughs> if the results are the same, I would do it again. All right. So what led you, I mean, what, what made you transition from the think tank to the classroom? Corona. Um, so backtracking a little bit, I was doing my job at the think tank. And the good thing about the job is we had summers off. Okay. And I was also, I always was traveling every couple of months, just like to leave the country and just, cause you know, it's, it's a lot cheaper out here. That sounds real bougie if I was in the U S but yeah. out here you can get a flight to like Thailand for $150 round trip. Like Man. if you just time it right, like I, that's, I just had, that's this, I just had that pay. experience in January. So I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. right. cause it, cause to somebody who doesn't know it, like, Oh, she just, she just every month, every other month, she just has to go somewhere. Like it sounds real like indulgent, but out here, right. that's like the equivalent of like a Sunday fun day. Like if yeah, you get your true. bottomless brunch in New York city and you do like a weekend or two with your girls, you spend about 150. Well, you yep. do that. I'm going to go to Thailand. <laughs> right. Right. So, um, so I would do those trips, but it also gave me time to start two different businesses. So okay. Black Expo is one of them, and Tian Me Bakery is the other one. Um, mm -hmm. And so starting those, they grew over the three years I was at my job. I think I started them about year two. They both grew to the point where I could quit my job. So last August, yeah, my birthday was my last day. Last August, I quit my job to go. You a Leo? I'm a Leo too. Virgo. But you. it depends on the horoscope is better. I was born on the cusp. <laughs> so if, if the Leo's I'm looking hurt. good that day, I'll take it. If the Virgo's looking I'm good hurt. that day. I'm hurt because anytime I see somebody whose birthday is in August, I'm just going to automatically Leo power. There we go. But it's all good. <laughs> it's, it's actually i think we've had this conversation before maybe a while back i, forget, I, I feel I think like our birthdays i think are not that far apart mine is august 12th I'm a, I'm a true leo thoroughbred okay. yeah okay you know what bye um anyway <laughs> <laughs> but um so starting those businesses they grew and i could i was able to like quit my job because one it was i had found my passion right and so going to a job that was functional while having a passion that like actually kept me up for me it just it stopped working and so being out here the cost of living is lower so it didn't feel as risky so I quit in August and then I went on a five-week trip to Africa because that is what you do as an entrepreneur um yeah. and <laughs> I was <laughs> and I was actually just on my way back from being home for Christmas I had some family stuff so I wanted I had to make sure I was home for Christmas to see people because there was health things um and i got back here in january tried to keep the business going but then corona happened yeah and my businesses are built and profitable for in person because yeah, i'm cooking food so i would host mo monthly dinners so that's right. in-person community dinners and then black expo it's 500 people supporting I've vendors had, you you've made uh some for me <laughs> twice and first time was some little cupcakes and I was just amazed. I was like, I gotta order this again. And then the second time was that that rum cake you made for me. I don't know how much rum you had in that, but me and my girlfriend, we towed that cake up. And we was walking around the house talking about some, are you feeling it? Are you feeling it? <laughs> Uh, Did I get you drunk good. off some cake? I believe so. Maybe not drunk, but a little tipsy. I little definitely tipsy. felt something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that rum cake was a signature when that came out. That it made it to like Beijing kids. Like people love that rum cake. Yeah. I actually just made some for a friend. She just moved to Guangzhou and I made her some, but she couldn't take it on the plane. I feel bad for really? her. Really? Cause she, well, she was moving, so she just had so uh, much stuff. She had so much stuff. Yeah, I, I get that. I, yeah, I, I'm a I just moved there. from Beijing. I just moved from Beijing to Chengdu last year, and I had to throw away so much stuff. But I still it had so much stuff to take. Really? Yeah. 
Yeah. Cause like I got a dog and like he has a bunch of stuff. Like I spoiled the heck out of my dog and he has like his own little closet full of snacks and treats and different clothes. And <laughs> you know, he gets spoiled and stuff like that. But other than that, I have like I'm a big technology head, so like I got like three computers. I got a game system. What you got? Uh I have an Xbox, I have a Switch. Um, Ooh. Yeah. I always mean to bring my Xbox back to my parents' house, and I never do. I, when I first moved to China, I didn't have my Xbox. I was like, I ain't gonna need this. Like, I'm gonna be traveling, and I'm gonna be out and about. Who needs a and house? And you realize that expat life turns into regular life real quick. Regular, regular life real quick, because I was living in life, and then I turned up, and I was like, wait, time out. I live here. This ain't, I ain't, a, like, I'm a guest. I'm a guest in that country, but I'm not a guest guest. I ain't leaving no time soon. I don't have no, I don't have no return ticket. Let me come, let me calm down. Yeah. So I went next, one time I went back home and I like brought a bunch of essentials back that I thought I would not need, but actually would need. Yeah. 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 Every time I go home, I always have an empty suitcase so that I can stock up on hair care products and just clothes that I simply cannot get out of here. Yeah. I've learned to do that as well. I've learned to do that as well. Uh, healthcare products, skincare products, things that like you would just never you can you can never find in China, and if you do, it's like an arm and a leg. Um. <laughs> Jergen, out here, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, China life is is it's an interesting piece out here. Yeah. So you doing this bakery? What led you? Like, did you bake before you came to China? Not professionally, but I've always loved baking. And so my parents, they didn't really buy sweets, but if you had all the ingredients for some brownies and you wanted brownies, that was how you got brownies. Like you weren't, no one was going to say, here's $10, like go to the store or here's $5, go to the store. It was more like there's butter, there's sugar, there's flour, there's cocoa. Sort of empowering you to, you know, create your own thing, you know. It was like I had a terrible sweet tooth, and they're like, "We're not gonna enable this." <laughs> okay, I tried to make it sound good. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, what is it? Uh, tell the truth and shame the devil. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, I just and so when I moved here, that sweet tooth didn't go anywhere. But the okay. dessert—if you're American, the dessert options out here are trash. Like you can get candy bars, but for me, actually, baked yeah. goods is much more of a thing than candy bars. So. Yeah. So I started baking, and then I would take stuff to my job because I just wanted one brownie, but I had a whole pan. So yeah. when, I I tell like, lo- when I tell the locals, when I tell the locals here, when I tell the locals here, like, okay, y'all like certain pastries and you know desserts and stuff like that, or and I, I get it, but I don't want a fruit cake every time I want cake. <laughs> you know, there's a there's a reason why fruit cake come fruit cakes in other countries only come out once a year. <laughs> there is nothing you more know? disappointing than a Chinese cake because they look gorgeous. They're so beautiful. They really and do they really look good. Bite yeah. into it, you're like, this is just air, cream, and fruit. Yeah, and honey, like, it'd be like honey melon or something like that. <laughs> Right, it's not even the fruits that you expect on a cake. <laughs> like watermelon and honeydew. Like what? Yeah. Like yeah. some crazy. But, some crazy. Yeah, I started, I was baking, I was giving it to my coworkers. And then one day my coworkers was like, you know that there's markets and you could sell this at a market. I was like, say what? I can make money back because butter out here is expensive. Yes, it is. Let's tell the truth. Butter is expensive and I bake like an American, so I bake with butter. So I was like, I can make some of this butter money back. Great. Mm-hmm. So that was how I got started. I started in the markets. Okay. Yeah. So you started. You started in the markets, and you know, who were who was buying when you started when you first started? Who was buying your product? All the foreigners. Okay, so you were mainly just I came, the foreigners. So I started with my first market was ridiculous. I made like, I don't know, 200 different little things between cinnamon rolls, bread pudding, cakes, cupcakes, I think maybe cookies too. And so if you're a Westerner who's not been able to find good dessert, 
in right. like months, if not years, then anytime you see something that looks remotely familiar, like they went for it. It didn't matter what type of foreigner they were, they got it. The reason I say foreigners because Chinese people, they're like, oh, this is too sweet. Because for a yeah. Chinese person, like a watermelon, like a ripe watermelon is about as sweet as they going to get. Yeah. That yeah. natural sugar, maybe, but mm -hmm. cinnamon rolls, they're like, oh, no, no, no. It's too sweet. It's too sweet for their, for their palate. Yeah. Yeah. But foreigners, that was my, that is, that's still my niche. I did think, I did um, a special thing for Easter this year. And I mean, they just killed me for all the orders. So, yeah. Yeah. Foreigners so, are so you were basically so you're basically started out um servicing foreigners. Did, you, did Chinese people ever buy anything? Because you know we are we just said that oh, they yeah. think it's too sweet, but you know, do you ever have yeah. any constant Chinese customers, anything like that? Mm, not constant, but I did well, I would have some here and there. Like someone had me, I remember someone ordered a red velvet cake for me. And I knew they were Chinese because they wanted blueberries on top. And I was like, that's not traditional, but okay. <laughs> I'll do it for you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, and I'm going to try to do extra because blueberries ain't cheap. Um, right. But I've had definitely at markets, especially for, I have some cakes that don't need icing. And so mm -hmm. those are the ones that do better with the Chinese clientele. Oh, okay. Because, okay. you know, icing is where you get a lot of the sugar in a cake, at least on the palate. Sugar's all right. throughout the cake, but on the palate, the icing has most of the sugar. So any cake without icing does pretty well with them. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, I get that. So we know Olivia Nadine, queen of cakes and pastries for the foreigners and some Chinese people. But let's move on to this expo, cause, and I gotta be honest, I swear to God, like I've been here since 2016, and you, I think you've been hosting the expo since, 2018, 2019, 2017? 2018. 2018, and I have yet to go to one. And I feel so bad. That's because every time it's on a schedule, right, I have to work. And by the time I got off work, it was just like, it was over. <laughs> it was like, I, you know, I can't do it. I did, I, honestly, I did make it to one last year before I moved to Chengdu, uh, but it was like the complete end of it. And the only thing that was on, on the only thing that was still going on was my good friend Mika. Do you know Mika? He was making a painting. Um, yeah, I know Mika. Yeah, and he was making a painting. And I mean, like that was probably like the only thing still going on. And uh, I was too tired. I was too tired to go to the after party because I had to work the next day. <laughs> yeah, well, that's like my only experience, but I've always seen the pictures and stuff like that. And I, and I know I spoke to everybody, vendors, customers, everybody says they always have a great time and things like that. So I want to ask you, like, what made you start this Black Expo thing? Um, okay, I'll keep it short. The short version is partly inspired by doing the markets for the bakery. Yeah. I knew I would see a lot of different opportunities, but I wouldn't see a lot of vendors who look like me. But yeah. on WeChat, you'd see all these people asking for um, different contact cards. Right. You know, somebody who does this, you know, somebody who does that. Like everyone every day is asking. So it's like, okay, there are all these black businesses and there's markets, but for some reason they're not coming together. Right. So I just realized it was a capacity issue for a lot of the markets. You kind of have to get in in order to play. So the only reason I was able to get in is because someone dropped out at the last minute and I was kind of uh, like aggressively on the organizer. And she's okay. like, all right, someone dropped out, you can get in. Once I got in, I was almost guaranteed a spot every time I applied. So okay. imagine that in your new business, that's what you're coming up against. So it's hard to get into the markets to, to meet exactly. your, your clientele. So I was like, there why was, not? Just there was no space a for our people, basically. Right, why not do a market for us? for okay. us, by us, <laughs> um, and yeah, it, it happened, and I put out a call on WeChat for help, that was how I met the co-founder of Block Expo, and it grew from there, so it went from one, it was going to be a one-off event in Beijing in March 2018, and then it became seven events, yeah, seven events across Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, 
between 2018 and 2019. And you were at all of them? I was, yes. I was at each and every one of them. Wow, so that was, you were stretching pretty thin, but I mean, I knew it took off. Like, after I saw the first one, I was like, wait, they got it in Shanghai now? I didn't even know about Shenzhen. I just know I saw it at least twice in Shanghai. I was like, wow, this thing is really taking off. And when I moved to Chengdu, I, I would say, before I moved to Chengdu, me and my girlfriend came out here in 2018, because I moved to Chengdu in 2019. We came out here in 2018, uh, not, not trying to move, but just to visit. We went to go see the pandas and mm -hmm. hike the mountain, see Big Buddha and things like that. But while I was here, I reached out to you know our, our, our groups on WeChat and was like, you know, who's black? Who's in Chengdu? I'm here for a couple of days. Like, like let's, let's, let's have a get together, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and um, I think I got, into a, I got in touch with like maybe four or five people. We started a group chat. And then after that, that group got huge. I think right now yeah. there's over 160 people in it, stretched between, stretched between Chongqing, Chengdu, and all of Sichuan province. Um, and and okay. some of it, some of it spilled out to over some of the, the closer provinces and things like that. Uh, but yeah, it's a pretty tight group and like, no one's hosting constant events, but every now and then someone's going like, Hey, I'm going to be over here. Or let's have a get together, blah, 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 all these things like that. Um, but yeah, um, <clears throat> when I got here to Chengdu, people were uh, posting the, the, the Shanghai Expo and, um, <laughs> and they were like, and they were like, well, how do we get this in Chengdu? And I was, and I was like, I was in the, I was in the group and I was like, well, I don't know if y'all got any vendors, but if y'all do, I know one of the organizers, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure she can help y'all out with that. Um, so yeah. we are hoping to get one in Chengdu someday. I hope so, because you know, we have, it's, it, Chengdu has a nice foreign presence here. Uh, like mm -hmm. I was I, just a few days ago, uh, me and a few people were just at a market, like the one that you were at when you were talking about your, um, you know, doing the bake bakery stuff. And it was nice. Mm -hmm. It was it was some foreign foreign places there. Some also some uh, Chinese shops and stuff like that. Um, but there <clears throat> there wasn't any uh, black owned businesses there. But there are black people who do things here, whether they're a hair salon or they're making food in their apartment for people and stuff like that. Uh, we don't have the space to, you know, you know, um, to grow, to, to show our, you know, what we got basically. Yeah. Um, so we okay. hope that we can get that. That was there. definitely on our list for this year before this year became this year. <laughs> yeah, COVID, COVID, COVID put a lot of things on, on, on hold. COVID put a lot of things on hold. You know, I was gonna go home back in February just to just to visit, and when that mm. stuff came, I was like, "Oh, I ain't going home no more." Well, that was smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was smart. For a lot of I'm thinking I'm just, of the ban. I'm not even gonna dive into how the U.S. looks right now. I'm just thinking of the travel ban. Oh yeah, because I know people who left, and they go, I'll, I'll, "I'll just come back. I'll just come back when it dies down." Bam. Nah, <laughs> it ain't gonna die it's down. It's still out there. It's, it's still, still out there. Out. Yeah. Um, so, all right. Oh, let me, let me get to something more technical with you. Um, just cause you've been out here for going on five years, maybe four or five years, something like that. Just round, just just round it up. <laughs> I just round it up. I just round up. Hey, I tell people five years. <laughs> it's easier. It's, it's, it's five calendar years. Four years for me, but I get I get what you mean. I get what you mean. <laughs> Hit me yeah. with the question. I got you. So, uh, can you just uh, speak on like uh, the type of growth that you've had, you know, since you've been here? Um, you know, whether it can be with your job or the bakery thing or the Black Expo. Like, what have you learned about yourself, or you know, mm -hmm. what have you learned about you know just living and you know anything else you can think of? Okay. So the most important thing I've learned being out here and being away from the U.S., and I think it's important that I'm away from the U.S. For me, other people have learned this being in the U.S., and I'm jealous of them, but for me, it's a getting out. Um, 
you can have an idea and make it happen. Right. Like, I know that sounds real simple and like, oh, that's not deep. But for me, it really was like, this is the first time I've really had ideas and pursued them and saw them come to life. Okay. And along the way, I wasn't afraid of, well, if it fails, what kind of, how, what will people think of me or what kind of shame will like I have? It was really just like try. And so one of the best books that I read out here that I think about all the time is Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. Okay. A lot of people know Think and Grow Rich. Napoleon Hill also made one specific for the black community because okay. a lot of times we might hear the examples of people who started off real poor and then got up and like, well, yeah, but they were white. So da 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 da. So the cool thing about Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice is that it is written with examples of black people. So you have no excuse. There's like people who fought through the racism, people who were like literally just freed slaves and became business owners, like multi-million dollar business owners. Uh, and so one of the things in it was just the power of, if you have an idea and you commit action to it, it can actually come to life. And that has been the most important lesson that I've learned in China because I've been able to see that actually taking place. And that's part of why I quit my job was because I felt so emboldened by like, I can see this idea in my mind's eye. So now I just need, I need all of my energy, all of my energy to be focused on making it real. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> and you said that maybe in the US you couldn't have had happened for you. Do you know why that is? I think whenever you're home is comfortable. And so, and there's a routine, whether it's routine for me as an individual or routine for me as a part of society. And so the idea when I was in the US was go to school, get a job, work the job, get a 401k, retire, then do the things that you want to do and then right. die. <laughs> and being out here is the wild wild west or the wild wild east like things change all the time everything's constantly shifting and i'm not home so no one is kind of suggesting that i do this no one is telling me i need to do this mm -hmm. i'm able to experience life on my own terms and it's hard admittedly because um there's things i've had to unlearn and there's right. things I've had to relearn. Like, for me to say, like, oh, you can have an idea and make it real, somebody's going to look at me and be like, well, that's, well, yeah, we're always taught as kids, whatever you put your mind to, you can achieve. But we say those things so passively that it's mm -hmm. cliche. We don't, a lot of us don't actually believe it. We're like, yeah, if you're rich, if you're this, if you're that, yeah, then you can be whatever you want to be. But right. it's actually full stop you can do whatever you want to do with intentional action. Like the action has to happen. It's not just going to magically happen. But um, I think for me in the U S I knew there was something more that I needed to do. I knew there was something more I wanted to do. I didn't feel fulfilled, fulfilled, but I also didn't know where to look. I didn't know what to do. Um, I just knew I needed to get out. <laughs> um, I need to get out to get that different breath of fresh air, that different perspective. Um, and so for me, I'm people who can figure this out without having to leave home. Those are some amazing people who are probably like taking over the world. Right. But for me, it took, it took a passport and traveling 16, 17 hours and living for about three years to really understand that um, the visions that I have for how I want my life to be and how I want the world to be can actually happen okay i love that answer because i feel the same way like I, I i felt like in america i was a little stuck as well i mean uh when you and i got here through different we came here for different reasons like when i was here when i was in chicago um after i graduated i was working for nonprofits. um like working for AmeriCorps, I did two AmeriCorps terms back to back, uh, mm. with make it, making little money, living at home with my parents. Uh, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. Um, 
but I was building my resume, so I thought it was cool. Uh, but after I and, and you know people were, people were telling me, hey, do two do, do two turns, and you know the jobs be pouring in. But after I did my two turns, I I I got so many no's, mm. and I was just like distraught. And then one day I went to a um, I went to a job fair, and I found EF, which is what brought me to China. <laughs> <laughs> you know. People, hey, say what you want about EF. Say what you want about EF. They be bringing, they they will bring you to China, or Russia, or Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take you where um, you want to go. Yeah. yeah, but when I first, honestly, when I first found them, I wasn't even interested. You know, um, I wanted to go abroad, but at the time, I was, you know, I was I was determined to make it there, and you know. After after getting so many no's, I was just like, you know what? Let me apply, and I applied, and I got the job, and then turn around. After I got the after I got the job offer, I actually found a job in my industry, what I wanted to do, and I was left with this decision. I was just like, do I work this job? Mm-hmm. What I want to do, make decent money. I could have gotten myself out of debt moved out of my parents' house, bought a car. I could have done all these types of things. Uh, but I was 23 at the time. And I was like, I can do this and I, when I'm 30. You know? And the, my initial mm-hmm. thought was, I'm only going to be in China a year. You know? <laughs> I'm only going to be there a year. You know? And here it is, 2020. Um, and I'm still here. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, we all come here for different reasons. And uh, my last question then, you know, we, we can sort of wrap it up. Um, so you got the bakery, you have Expo. Uh, you know, do you have any future plans outside of those things? I mean, yeah, but <laughs> um, yeah, I'm always plotting and planning. So I, I made my five-year plan uh, the other day because I've just learned I need to get a even more laser focus. Um, but in two years, my plan is to actually go back to the US. Okay. So I come from a family of entrepreneurs. And for the last 18 years, my uncle with my aunts and my mom have my, and my other uncle have been running um, a shop, an African import shop in Savannah, okay. Georgia called Diaspora Marketplace. And they came, they've been running it partly in legacy of my uncle who passed away, but then also like they're all entrepreneurs in their own right. And I think I'm the only one of my first cousins who's like remotely interested in taking okay. it over. So I'm a, I'm a see what I can do to help keep going with the family legacy. Yeah. And, but you, um, you've built a wealth of knowledge here in China and experience where you can, yeah. You can take that business over, maybe take it to the next next level, or you know, just run it how it was, you know. Um, but that's so that's my thing is two years and then I'll be back stateside. And honestly, who knows? The way life is, I feel like Corona, if it's taught us nothing else, it's taught us that um con- continuity and stability is just an illusion. Anything can happen to shift what we think is supposed to happen. But if, you know, everything works together, whether it's God or not, like if everything works together, I'll be back in two years, taking over the family shop and, you know, running, running Black Expo and B from the state side. Wow. I I was going to ask, like, well, you know. Oh, yeah. We're not giving up on. If you leave, does Black Expo leave? I mean, you know. No. So that's why I'm saying two years, because there's a okay. few things I need, systems I need to build and contingencies. Because we want, I mean, the whole point of Black Expo now is, so now Black Expo is one part of the larger company. The larger company is B. And the whole point for B is to be a vehicle to uplift the entire Black community, Black and African okay. community, like in tangible ways. It sounds... Uh, ambitious and it is but um, we have a few different ways that we're working on we're building an e-commerce platform so with corona not being able to do in-person events we don't want to stop supporting our vendors just because we can't like hug them 
So we're building out the e-commerce platform so that our vendors and new vendors can join the B family and keep everyone going on the up and up. And then we have a few more tricks up our sleeve that we learned from being out here in China. So, you know, looking at the likes of Alipay, looking at the likes of Taobao and how their ecosystems work and how we can leverage that experience yeah. for the global African diaspora. I love it. I love all of that. And <laughs> I'm going to be right there supporting you. <laughs> and you know liking and sharing if that's the least i can yes, do please yeah. please do we're on all the instagram and twitter and facebook well now that you mention it um you know for the people who are listening if, <laughs> so that they can keep up with miss olivia nadine nadine sorry um can you just list off some social media for the yeah. people so my personal social is all Olivia, is it? No, it's Miss O Nadine, no spaces, M-I-S-S-O Nadine. Uh, that's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And that is just me, um, regular. Instagram is where I'm most active, but um, it's just me posting different things that I'm doing, sometimes a little bit behind the scenes. Oh, and on YouTube, I started a vlog. I'm going to restart that now that I'm moving to my new place. I have more freedom to do more vlogging and okay. more interesting I'm going so. to follow your blog. Your vlog. <laughs> when I come, yeah. As soon yeah. as we off this call, I'm going to look that vlog <laughs> <Yeah>. up. <laughs> Thank you. And then the company, oh, you can, you can see my struggle vlog when I was, wrapped up in a blanket feeling mad stressed out and i was like i just need to i just need to speak to somebody or something um that was a real interesting one my mom said i look real sad but i didn't feel sad when i recorded it anyway and then for the company uh the website is buildandb.com so like building with bob the builder build and b b e.com and that's also our handles for all of our socials so on instagram and twitter it's build and b Okay. Oh, yeah. And then you can get to know us about Black Expo, some of the things we're trying to do, our internship program, and just kind of peep a little bit more behind the scenes about while we try to take over the world. <laughs> Absolutely. For our uh, people listening in China, if they want one of these rum cakes that I'm raving about, how can they get in touch with you? Hmm. All right. So they can hit me up on WeChat. The WeChat ID is, if they speak Chinese, it's easier, but Tianmi Bakery, T-I-A-N-M-I Bakery, no spaces. And they can add that WeChat ID and just slide into my DMs. Uh, Now that I've moved, I am actually going to start taking orders again. I had to stop for about a month or two I was starting to burn out a little bit and it was mm. a little hard with having my own kitchen because Corona shut down my production kitchen. So sure. yes, they nimble in these China streets. You can't. <laughs> Absolutely. So, <laughs> so now that Flex- I've moved. Flexibility out, is key here. Flexibility right. is key. Everybody becomes a yogi out here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now that I have my own kitchen again, I'm going to start baking again. So they can hit me up at Tianmi bakery if you know chinese it's tian me like the word for honey um but tian me bakery yeah all right cool and lastly um for the listeners do you have anything you like to say like words of encouragement or you know lasting thoughts anything floor is yours mm-hmm. and then we're gonna end i would say if you've ever had a, a dream an idea Um, that came to you and you saw it clearly and you saw it so clearly that it scared you and you're like, where did that come from? Run after it. Follow it with great intention and mess up, trip, fall, do it wrong, get back up and keep running after it because those are the visions that were given to specific people for specific reasons because the world needs them. And we need more people to actually follow through on them. So don't worry about messing up. We all mess up. Like, I'm trying not to cuss, but we all mess up. And that's <laughs> fine. The messing yeah. up is not the part. The messing up is just the lesson. Like, 
that's how you learn how to do better the next time. But the real issue is when you don't do it at all because you're scared of failure. So start running, get your band-aids, get your first aid kit, and keep it trucking. Yeah. Well, those are some great words. I appreciate that. Um, and I really appreciate you joining me on my initial episode for the Black Book Podcast. <laughs> Uh, when I first started to think about who to uh, interview, you are literally one of the first person I thought about. I was like, I gotta get Olivia on, and I was in here thinking, contemplating. I can't do, I can't do the podcast if she ain't, if she ain't gonna be my guest. I can't do it. You out here, you're out here doing amazing things, and like we needed to highlight that, you know. And oh, thank you. <clears throat> And uh, I can't wait till you do more because I'm going to invite you back. Um, and, you know, we got we got an open door policy over here. So <laughs> maybe sometime, Ooh, that's next, dope. Thank you so some, much. sometime next year yeah. or whenever, whenever, whenever we feel growth or in, whenever we got something to say, we got a door open, we're going to invite you back. We're going to have a conversation. All right. Awesome. I look forward to it. All right. Well, thank and you I'm again. And I'm honored. I'm honored to be your first guest, and I yeah. cannot wait to hear all the other great stories that you bring to light, and more of your story. I learned a bunch about you today, so that's that's pretty dope. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, we got some stories that's gonna be rolling out because uh, not only just people living in China, but there are people, man, that are just doing some great things all around the globe who um, we just don't know about or you know they just have they just have to be known and stuff like that and so that's kind of what the podcast is for just let these people have their moment um to say you know who they are what they're doing uh because i think we need the space for that um thank you again for coming uh i'm eric charles this is miss olivia nadine and that is the black book podcast i'm just on a mission i'm trying to